So welcome everyone to this uh, webinar about privacy by design for the total learning architecture. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, this webinar is designed specifically for uh, activity providers who, uh, sorry. So welcome everyone to this webinar about privacy by design for the total lear learning architecture. Thank you all for being here. Um, this uh, webinar is specifically designed for backend developers who develop uh, the specifications and core infrastructure of the TLA. So this is the first in a series of three webinars, and this one is specifically tailored to TLA backend developers. So before we start, a, a short disclaimer. Um, this work has been supported by a DoD award for the uh, Advanced Distributed Learning Initiative. However, the views expressed in this uh, webinar are my own and do not necessarily re reflect the views of uh, ADL or the DoD. So the goal of this uh, webinar and of the series of webinars is to inform TLA performers about the aspects of TLA that impact users' privacy concerns. So since TLA is still under development, we have a unique opportunity to develop it in a way that inherently takes privacy into account. And this approach is called privacy by design. And it has been shown to be one of the best ways to alleviate users' privacy concerns. So in this webinar, I will make recommendations on how to build TLA in a way that um, respects users' privacy. Now note that the recommendations that I'm going to talk about today and that are uh, in the uh, specification document that I uh, created uh, are tentative and are subject to continued discussion and revision. So this webinar is not only an opportunity for you to learn about uh, privacy by design for TLA, but also to give feedback and to discuss some of these uh, ideas that I will be presenting today. And so for that, we have uh, Dr. Ash in the room who uh, will assist me in um, um, letting me know when there are any questions. So if you do have questions, you can ask those in one of two ways. You can either raise your virtual hand and then Dr. Ash will notify me and she will unmute your microphone. Or if you don't want to talk to me directly, you can also ask your question in the chat and then Dr. Ash will ask the question to me. So let's start with a couple of definitions. And I know that most of you will already know all these terms, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So first of all, the total learning architecture. This is a set of specifications for creating a learning management system that integrates learning applications into personalized e-learning solutions. So the personalized aspect of this, as well as the fact that it integrates uh, various learning uh, applications, um, is what makes it so important to deal with users' privacy. So that's why we have the webinar today. Uh, then privacy by design, as I mentioned, it's a design philosophy in which privacy is addressed in the design of the system rather than after the system has already been developed. So doing this up front is the best way of doing it. And then operational characteristics. So I will be talking about various operational characteristics of TLA. So these are aspects of TLA that may influence users' privacy. And I'm going to talk about how these operational characteristics can be designed in such a way uh, that privacy is uh, taken into account in the design of those operational characteristics. Then personally identifiable information. That is, this is information that reveals a person's real life identity. And de-identification is the practice of removing personally identifiable information from a set of data. And then finally, pseudonymity is a means to identify a person within a system, but without revealing any links to their true identity outside the system. Uh, for instance, a username that is not linked to the user's real name is an example of a pseudonym. So um, here are the topics that we're going to discuss today. We will first review research on how users make privacy decisions and give you some examples on how to best support users' privacy decision-making practices. So the user 
is the first operational characteristic. And although this is not un, uh, under the explicit control of the system, learning a little bit about how we can support users' uh, privacy decision-making practices is an important aspect of dealing with privacy in TLA. Then we will consider the uh, various uh, um, um, uh, types of data that can be collected by TLA and the considerations that we have to uh, make when we collect all these different types of data. Next, we will address ways to efficiently present recommendations and adaptations while avoiding privacy problems. So this is looking at how do we present recommendations? Uh, so in an adaptive learning system, we need to somehow present some adaptivity to the user. So how do we present that to the user in a way that doesn't bother them? And next, we will discuss the questions of data location and ownership and make a proposal uh, regarding how personal data should be managed within the TLA architecture. And then finally, we consider the value of inspecting your own data, the dynamics of social sharing, for instance, in social learning applications, and the effects, uh, the ethics of user research and the validity of making employment decisions based on uh, uh, users' training data. So as I mentioned, uh, this particular webinar is developed for backend developers who develop the specifications and core infrastructure of the TLA. There will be two other uh, webinars. Uh, one will be for uh, activity developers, and another one will be for uh, training department managers. So the first one will be on June uh, 8th, that's upcoming Thursday, and the other one will be next Monday. Um, so um, if you are interested in learning more about this, this webinar is um, based on our first privacy specification document for the total learning architecture. So this is a 100-page report that can be found at the web address that I listed here. Um, and this web uh, site also includes a 10-page summary version of that document. And um, I will, uh, after this presentation, I will upload the slides and some general information about the project. Um, as well as the recording of this webinar that I just started. Um, so without further ado, let's actually start the webinar now. All right, so we start with the user characteristics. So privacy issues are an, und an undying obstacle to real world uh, learning applications, uh, especially learning applications that use uh, personal data. And so while there exist uh, several privacy preserving technical solutions to dealing with user data, um, the concept of privacy is inherently a human attitude towards the collection, distribution, and use of disclosed data. So disclosure in itself, people giving that information away, is a human behavior. And we have to deal with that human behavior regardless of any technical solutions that we use. So it is therefore important to understand the research on how users uh, of information systems like the total learning architecture make privacy decisions. Um, so we will review this research and we will also give you some examples of how to support users' privacy decision-making practices. So because we are both looking at the user characteristics as well as ways to support users, if you are following along in the specification document, that's actually sections one and six of the specification document. So this section um, uh, of the presentation can be summarized with two broad findings. And the first finding is that users are not categorically against disclosing their personal information. If you have an application that uses the data in a useful way, people are okay with disclosing that information as long as it's useful. And so this trade-off is called the privacy calculus. People seek a balance between the potential risks of disclosing their personal information and the benefits of this disclosure. So if the benefits are substantial, they will actually disclose their personal information. Now, the second point is that although people do this, although they make this trade-off, 
users are not very good at this privacy calculus. They, they, they often, um, um, their decisions are often influenced or influenceable by things as a default privacy setting. So there are kind of heuristic, non-rational influences that change people's behavior. So even though people make these decisions, they're not very good at it. So to delve a little deeper into that, here's a graphic that synthesizes the research in this area. So if we look at the rational side here, and we see that behavior is in the middle, um, uh, sorry, disclosure is in the middle, the rational uh, aspect of this, disclosure is a trade-off between perceived risk and perceived relevance. Now, uh, risk can be reduced by reducing user system-specific privacy concerns. So if they are concerned about their privacy within your system, they will perceive a high risk of disclosing things. So we need to reduce their risk with the system. Now, there are several ways of doing that. An important aspect there is the trust in the provider of that system. So if you build a longer term trust with a user as a provider of an application or as, a, as uh, the provider of a total learning architecture, they will be uh, more likely to uh, lo uh, perceive lower pr uh, privacy risks uh, and will just increase their disclosure. But there's also perceived relevance, right? And so perceived relevance depends on the benefits of, uh, of the information. So it's important that if you want to um, uh, encourage people to disclose their information, reducing risk is one thing, but another thing you can do is highlighting the benefits of disclosing that information. And that will actually help increasing uh, people's uh, disclosure. Now, as I mentioned, there's also heuristic influences. So for example, uh, the context in which the decision is being made, even the number of options that they have available can influence their decision. Uh, or for instance, the default setting, as I said. So whether something is turned, some type of information collection is turned on or off by default does influence their decision even beyond their rational decision making. And finally, uh, uh, effective uh, heuristic influences are uh, uh, happening as well. So for instance, whether you frame something as a loss of privacy or a gain of uh, benefits is another uh, uh, thing that can really affect the way they, uh, whether they disclose their information. So given all these influences on users' privacy decisions, it's really important for the people who are developing TLA, the back end of TLA, um, to regularly survey users about their perceptions of TLA um, regarding the, the uh, privacy. So this means privacy-related attitudes, um, but also privacy-related behaviors, and really track how uh, uh, risk, relevance, and disclosure behaviors are uh, influenced throughout their uh, continued use uh, uh, of a uh, total learning architecture. Um, at the same time, you also want to track these uh, deleterious effects of heuristics. So you really want to make sure that those uh, heuristical influences aren't making them over or under disclose. So one way of doing this would be to conduct a study maybe a, a survey combined with some uh, log data, uh, where you try to see, for instance, which activity providers do users trust and distrust, uh, what data do they and don't they disclose, and why, and how sticky are the default TLA privacy settings. So as privacy, per, uh, but also as privacy perceptions uh, actually evolve over time, such a st study, study should probably be done very early in the development process of TLA. So maybe at an initial implementation, you already want to test this, and you want to track this over time and do this repeatedly. <coughs> so the next thing I want to talk about is, so we, we, we realize that people make both um, heuristic and rational decisions. But how do they manage these two types of decision making? So this is explained by the elaboration likelihood model, which integrates these two phenomena in a, in a single, uh, in, in a single uh, model. And so it proposes two types of information processing. 
Um, the rational influences on behavior are called central rod processing, and the heuristic influences are the peripheral rod. So when people are using the central rod, they make an effort to understand the true risks and benefits of disclosure. So a good privacy protection mechanism can really sway people who are using the central route uh, to disclose their personal information. So they are definitely swayed by an app that behaves trustworthy. On the other hand, in the peripheral route, people do this heuristic processing. So their decisions are based on kind of super, superficial influences, such as the reputation of the website or any privacy guarantees that are being made or uh, a website design quality. And so in this case, people actually get influenced by whether the app looks trustworthy rather than behaves trust trustworthy. So it's a good idea when you're developing uh, an application to both behave and look trustworthy. And that holds both for the TLA as a whole as well as for uh, individual applications that are TLA enabled. So we need to cater to both routes. Uh, for people in central processing, provide them with detailed privacy controls and maybe give them uh, the opportunity to read a privacy policy. Where, whereas for people um, in the peripheral route, it might be good to provide them sensible default settings because they don't want to actually engage with these privacy settings. And maybe give them simple privacy notices in case um, um, control is unavoidable. So. Aside from catering to both routes, an interesting idea is to see if we can encourage people to take more, to make more rational privacy decisions. So can we motivate people to actually take the central route when they make these privacy decisions? Well, that is actually possible using, um, by increasing their perceived ability to make privacy decisions and by increasing their motivation, by improving their motivation. So how would we do that? Now, two ways in which to do that would be contextualized controls and comic-based information. These are the, just two things that I've been working on, and I mentioned a couple more in the document. But to give you an example, for contextualized controls, uh, here on the left side, uh, there's an example of uh, what is a form auto-completion tool. So you've seen this on a, in a browser. When you start filling out your name, it automatically fills out the entire form. Now, this is notoriously bad for people in the peripheral processing route because they would, you know, because it fills out the entire form, it's very easy for people to ignore making a careful decision about whether they want to disclose or withhold each piece of potentially private information. So, to overcome that problem, I created a version of an auto completion tool that added a button to the end of each field that allows people to remove the information from that specific field. And so that doesn't really give people much more control than what they would normally have. But by showing them these buttons, they are more likely to feel motivated and to feel uh, able to actually change their current settings. So it, it turns out that when you do this, people actually tend to move more to the central processing route. So that's on the control side. On the information side, we all know that privacy policies, most people don't read them. And that's because they're usually just too long, too complex, and boring, right? So when we are actually working on replacing uh, privacy policies by, uh, so the textual policies, by comic-based policies. And so the idea here is that they are more motivating. Right? They motivate people to actually read these policies. They are also more engaging. They will uh, retain users' attention for a longer amount of time. Users will also remember these policies better. And another benefit of this is that you can look at the policy from a distance and kind of just see where you want to focus your attention. So this is another way to kind of engage people into uh, making more central route uh, privacy decisions. All right, so this is privacy decisions when it comes to disclosing information or not. Now we're going to talk about another aspect of privacy, which is um, communication. So in the spirit of social learning, 
TLA-based applications may actually have social networking components built into them. And maybe the TLA architecture in itself may have some social networking capabilities as well. So in light of social networking, it's important to know that different types of users prefer different types of social networks. So we have found that two very prominent types of users are what we call FYI communicators and non-FYI communicators. So FYI communicators are more likely to use passive, asynchronous, and one-to-many services like Facebook, Twitter, and location sharing services. Whereas non-FYI communicators are more likely to use active, synchronous, and one-to-one -one services like WhatsApp, Skype, or just a regular old telephone. So that's one distinction that we find. Another thing that we find is that even within a certain social network, there's usually many different ways in which we can manage our privacy. And most people don't use all of these mechanisms, but they make a selection on what mechanisms they use. And so we find that there are specific profiles for people that use different privacy management strategies. So here's an example of where we did this for uh, Facebook users. So we analyzed the uh, privacy behaviors of several hundred Facebook users and boiled them down into six different profiles. So aside from privacy maximizers, who are very likely to disclose almost everything, and uh, sorry, uh, very likely to engage in almost every uh, privacy management strategy, and uh, privacy minimalists who do very little, we also find people who are selective sharers, uh, who share a lot of information, but carefully decide what they want to share with whom, uh, self-censors, who share what they share with everyone, but limit the amount that they share, uh, and time savers, who are um, likely to consume information on social networks only and make sure that the amount of information that they get in uh, is not too high, so in order to prevent information overload. And finally, privacy balancers, who kind of do a little bit of everything. Right? So those are the different uh, privacy management strategies that we got from Facebook. And now, I think that a similar classification is likely possible for TLA users as well and for TLA-based systems. So I think we should provide privacy support mechanisms for each type of user. So also, um, TLA should provide um, maybe a social network style communication, if there is a social network or, or um, social learning capabilities should provide social network uh, style communication for FYI communicators, but maybe more direct chat style interaction for people who are non-FYI communicators. So again, it's very important to provide a mechanism for users to manage their privacy in the way that is most comfortable for them. So in a previous section, we've talked about users' decision to disclose their personal information, but now we're going to talk about the, what, what is this personal information, right? So what, how is this data being collected or disclosed? And what are the, what are the things that we need to take into account when uh, we uh, regard different types of data? So this will reflect section two in the specification document if you're reading along. So the first thing I want to talk about is levels of identifiability. So it's important to note that privacy doesn't just relate to personally identifiable information. Because even when data is anonymized, there exist mechanisms to re-identify its owner. So an example of this is um, uh, Netflix had a public data set with anonymized or de like de-identified uh, um, uh, movie watching profiles, movie and series watching profiles for a number of users. But researchers were able to cross-link this data uh, with uh, public uh, IMDB data. And by doing this, they were able to uh, re-identify a closeted gay mom's uh, private Netflix profile. So they were able to find out her private watching history from linking the rest of her watching history with her public watching history on IMDB. So this is a big problem. Obviously, it would also be a big problem in uh, military applications uh, because 
you know, being able to re-identify people's uh, data could um, lead to um, um, uh, the re revelation of uh, secret identities and locations or blackmailing or spear phishing. So it's really important to really note that, you know, even when we de-identify data, it can be re-identified and we need to be careful with this. So one way of doing this is we need to go beyond pseudonymity and really de-identify the data in a way that it becomes anonymous. So there's methods like differential privacy and homomorphic encryption that can be used to make sure that the data cannot be re-identified. And that's very important for certain types of data that are indeed uh, mission critical. But even beyond that, pseudonymity in itself is very useful. Even without providing full anonymity, uh, pseudonymity is useful, especially when you want to foster creativity and intimacy. So for example, if you have learner forums where a user may fear hum humiliation for asking a silly question, then you know, if we, if we uh, allow uh, pseudonymity, they may not feel like that, that will um, uh, hurt them too much. Um, on the other hand, there is research, uh, there are situations where um, pseudonymity is not a good idea, where you want to actually be able to link users to their real names. And this would be in formal training situations or for instance, diplomatic settings, like uh, when you're conducting uh, joint military training between to uh, separate forces. Um, if you use real identity in these cases, research has shown that it reduces things like trash talk and unfair behavior. So that's very important uh, to note that in those cases, you may not want anonymity or even pseudonymity. So switching a little bit here, um, TLA does not just involve conventional learning and training. Um, and users are expected to receive credit for experiences that they gain outside the formal learning systems as well. So if I'm reading an ebook or if I'm watching a documentary, the idea, one of the philosophies of TLA is that this will be credited to you as a learning experience as well. So this creates kind of a fluid boundary uh, between learning and other activity. So that's that means that TLA may actually collect behavioral data kind of on the fly when the user is just moving around in their, in their personal lives. So it can do fitness tracking, it might be tracking my reading behavior, my psychological well-being, my financial health. All these kinds of data may be collected by a TLA-based system. So for each of these different types of data, there's unique privacy implications. And unfortunately, this webinar uh, does not provide the amount of time to go into each of these individual pieces of uh, information. So for that, I do refer you to section two of the document. Um, but it's important to know that users should be able to consider privacy settings for each of these different types of data separately. Not all data is equal. Now, I do wanna um, um, highlight one type of data that is particularly important. Um, which is um, <coughs> um, excuse me that was okay sorry <laughs> uh, one, one type of data that is uh, particularly important which is learn learner runtime activity so this is a detailed account of the activities that happen during a training now this is really sensitive data because if you have this really low level data, which is basically what X API typically tries to collect, if you collect that data and store it somewhere, if someone gets to it, it can actually reveal details um, and maybe team weaknesses and all kinds of technical uh, aspects of, of that training. So that data should be really carefully de-identified, obfuscated, and probably encrypted. So it's really important that the data cannot fall in the wrong hands. And it's not just uh, learner runtime activity data, but there's other type of data that is sensitive as well. For instance, users' health data, right? In fact, health data is managed by um, one of the few privacy legislations that we have in this country called HIPAA. So if you collect health data, 
um, you have to actually adhere to that privacy law. And I talk a little bit more about that in, in the document. But with this type of data, with learner runtime activity and with health data and, and maybe certain other data like location, like very granular location, one thing that I want to recommend is to actually not collect that data server side. Um, where possible, that data might be better, it might be better for a system to actually process it and use it locally. And our devices are getting more and more popular. So it is possible for these devices to actually um, provide a more, uh, provide some kind of personalization uh, um, mechanisms on the user's device. That way you don't have to actually collect that data. And if you still want to collect it, you, collect it, you could collect it more in aggregate. And I think that's, a, that's the most surefire way to make sure that the data cannot fall into the wrong hands. Now, more generally, I think it's a good idea not to track users too much anyway. Um, if users think that they are constantly being tracked, then this may have a chilling effect on their sense of freedom. So this is called the panopticon effect after this circular prison here that was developed, uh, designed by uh, Jeremy Bentham. So in this panopticon, um, prisoners, um, they know that they can be watched. So there's people in the watchtower that can see every prison cell. However, the people in the cells cannot see the watchers. So they always have the possibility of being watched, but they don't know when they're being watched. This is something you do not want to have in a learning application, right? This is not something you want to have while you're learning something, that you are constantly feel that you're being watched. So that's something that you want to prevent. Now, on the other side of the coin, if users want to contribute data to the system, you should definitely encourage them to do that. So TLA-based systems should, for instance, encourage users to submit their learning ambitions. So this will help leverage intrinsic motivation within the system. That's a really good idea. Um, also, learning-based systems should allow uh, users to at least selectively add competences that they have gained outside of the TLA system. So that's another important aspect of, you know, there are things that happen outside of the TLA. Can we import them into the system? Very important. So going back to this idea of kind of continuous tracking, it's important that users are aware of what is being tracked and that they have control over this tracking, right? To prevent the panopticon, the best way to prevent it is to really show the users at all time what is going on so that they know when they're not being tracked and when they are being tracked and that they can easily switch this on and off. So TLA-based systems should provide such context-sensitive controls, as I mentioned earlier. And I have some examples of this here. Um, one example would be a control center widget that they can turn off uh, and on during uh, certain times. Um, and maybe allow some manual override. So the night shift feature of um, uh, iOS is a, is a good example of this, right? So TLA activity training might be turned off automatically outside of work hours and can be turned off uh, manually as well. Um, another example is a notification. When tracking is available, when the user is doing an activity that may constitute learning, you can show a little pop-up that then allows users to turn on the tracking on the fly. Or if you want to be a little more persistent, the pop-up might say that the tracking starts automatically, but the user should be able to at least stop it quite easily. Now, if you want to force users into the central processing route, then you make this a modal pop-up where they can't do anything until they make a decision on whether they want to be tracked or not. And finally, if the system is tracking, Users could be reminded of this with something like a little recording bar here at the top that actually shows the user that they are being tracked at that point. And whenever there's no, no such bar, they know that they're not being tracked. <coughs> so TLA tracks information so that it can make inferences about the user's learning performance. That's the whole idea, right? We track this information while they are learning and outside their learning. And 
this is being this is being used to figure out their uh, um, uh, their learning performance. So these inferences should really be treated with care um, because users really hate incorrect inferences, even if they are inconsequential. They really don't like um, uh, and, and inferences that are wrong. So even if a certain so if a certain inference could be wrong. It might be better to ask the user for a confirmation than to uh, uh, act upon the inference. Now, even correct inferences can be problematic, especially when they're a little creepy. You know, some some types of adapt adaptive behavior just feels really creepy, and the best way to avoid that is to explain the inference uh, that may actually reduce the inf uh, the, the creepiness. So explain why a certain recommendation or why a certain inference has been made. Now, another important thing is that these inferences can create a potential for discrimination. So for example, um, one thing we know is that women perform better on paper tests uh, than on computerized tests. So uh, inferences based on computerized tests might be biased against women. So you need to be really careful in how you use these inferences and to make sure that you're not biasing yourself against uh, one group or in favor of another. That's a, it's, it's a difficult situation. So the best way to uh, avoid any unwanted inferences is to really allow the user to inspect and correct them. This is called scrutability. So Google, for example, allows users to see what topics they have inferred from your search and Gmail history when it comes to giving you advertisements. So you can actually go into your advertisement topics, and that will tell you what Google has inferred about you. And you can remove topics that don't actually match your preferences, or you can turn off ad personalization altogether. So this type of control is definitely beneficial for people who are worried that the system is making the wrong inferences. All right. So now we've talked about how TLA-based systems collect data from their users to provide personalized learning recommendations and personalized learning experiences. So to do this, these systems have to make kind of on-the-fly recommendations and adaptations to the learning experience. So similar to data collection, these recommendations and adaptations themselves may sometimes bother the user. So in this section, we will address ways to efficiently and effectively present you, uh, recommendations and adaptations while avoiding privacy problems. So this is talking about privacy, not so much in the terms of information privacy, but in the sense of a right to be left alone, right? So if you want to learn more about this, you can read section three of the specification document, and I'll give you an overview right now. So the TLA specification actually talks about three specific types of adaptations, meta adaptations, macro adaptations, and micro adaptations. So meta adaptations are personalized recommendations on what learning activity the user should engage in next. So for instance, you should train your French. Macro adaptations are recommendations on what to do within an activity. So for instance, you should work on your irregular verbs. And finally, micro adaptations are small adjustments to the activity, uh, to the current activity based on the context. So for instance, if you're going to Montreal, the language app can uh, add some local idiom to the learning application. So adaptations have really important benefits. And it's important to think about those, because as I mentioned all the way in the beginning, it's important to mention those benefits when you're collecting information. So they reduce, and, uh, they reduce choice and information overload, and they make it easier for users to find content and providers that fill their needs. So that's great. So for application developers, adaptations also create a sustained relationship with the user. For example, Netflix actually considers its recommendation algorithm as one of its biggest assets. 
On the other hand, adaptations tend to focus on users' current desires rather than their future goals. And that's very important to know that. Um, they may create what is called a filter bubble. They, people kind of feel that they are prevented from exploring new learning experiences beyond what is being recommended if these recommend recommendations are made, made too forcefully. Um, and another problem with this is that users may become overly dependent on these recommendations of TLA and no longer play an active role in deciding what they want to learn. So that, those are problems that we should try to avoid. So important, uh, an important way to, to prevent some of these problems is to um, provide kind of multi-purpose adaptations. So recommendations can be made more generally to support a task or higher goal, for exploration, to fulfill an organizational need. So the idea is that all these purposes should be considered in deciding what to recommend. And ideally, the user should be in control of this. They should be able to decide what aspects uh, are, are actually included. So an overall goal here is to support what I call self-actualization, to support the user's own journey in deciding what to learn rather than to decide for them. So in this case, um, the adaptations can actually help users decide what they want to learn rather than decide for them. So explanations are a good way to do this. They can increase the acceptance of a recommendation. Um, but you have to be a little careful uh, with that as well, because uh, explanations should not be overly pushy, right? Uh, it's always a good idea to give the user options, to always allow them to choose other things as well. Again in line with that idea of self-actualization. So another important aspect is kind of the output modalities of those recommendations. Where will they be shown? How will they be presented to the user? So users can receive adaptations and recommendations on various devices. And when using a personal device, such as a smartphone or a watch, you have to make sure that those recommendations are carefully timed. Uh, and don't interrupt the user's current task. Apple yesterday announced a new feature for uh, iOS, which is don't inter interrupt me while I'm driving. I think TLA should do the same thing, right? Uh, so a smart kind of silent or do not disturb mode can really avoid uh, uh, intruding upon the uh, user's privacy or their current activity. On the other hand, when you're using larger devices, sometimes even public devices, such as a large computer screen or a television, you have to be careful not to show recommendations when there are bystanders, because sometimes these, these recommendations can reveal classified or mission critical information or personally embarrassing information, right? So be careful who is around when you're presenting recommendations in a more public setting. All right. Now we, uh, now we uh, switch to the topic of data location and ownership. So TLA-based systems collect, generate, and store large, large amounts of data. That's what we've noticed by now. But we've talked about how users disclose this information, what type of information it is, where that informa what that information is used for. But where does the data go? And who owns the data? Those aspects will be discussed in this section um, where we talk about location, uh, data location and ownership. So we will make a proposal regarding how personal data should be managed within the TLA uh, architecture. And more details, again, can be found uh, in the specification document. In this case, it's section four. All right. So let me give you an overview again. This is. Um, kind of the three components of TLA that are relevant to the collection, storage, and processing of personal information. This is based on some architectural docu uh, documentation of the TLA. This is not the architectural presentation, but it's the parts of the architecture that are important for data collection and storage. So we have here the TLA data core, which um, stores all the information. We have the processors that use the information to provide adaptations. 
and we have the user-facing apps that generate data and may use data to provide adaptations as well. And they're the, uh, the part that actually interfaces with the user and collects the data as well. So where should the TLA processors and data core reside? Where are, where, where are these applications? If we build a TLA, who, wh where is the system, right? Is it, is it um, a single system for the entire US Army? Probably not. Is there a separate TLA for every single division or every single cohort? Per department even? Probably not. So ideally, this architecture should be controlled by an entity that is actually trusted by all of its members. So if you go too high, that's too difficult. That doesn't work. So one example could be the TLA, uh, one TLA per training department. I think that could be very good because that is already a trusted entity when it comes to training. But you have to be careful with this as well. And in some cases, you may want to actually share these uh, uh, TLA systems because that would make because if you make TLA systems too granular, if you make too many of them, it makes it the, the mobility between departments very difficult. So you don't want to create data silos because those are typically bad for user modeling. So it's I don't really have a solution here, but I think it's important for TLA developers to think about. Where, sh where should each TLA instance reside? So the goal is to find the optimal level uh, of, impl of implementation of a TLA. Low enough for trust, but high enough to allow for uh, mobility and, and reduce data silo. All right. So, Going a little more into the nitty gritty of different types of adaptations, where should, um, which components should be responsible for which type of data that is being collected? So we believe that the TLA processor should be responsible for doing meta adaptations and using data for meta adaptations. Because these adaptations require knowledge of the user's integrated learner profile, right? Only by knowing what the user knows from several applications can I recommend what application they should use next. Uh, the processors can also do the ma uh, macro adaptations, but applications may re rely on some internal and often proprietary logic to make these adaptations. So I think this is better um, uh, relegated to the uh, individual applications, those uh, uh, macro adaptations. And then when we talk to, uh, when we talk about micro adaptations, I think it's actually best to do the, to do those client side, because these are usually based on learner runtime data, and as I mentioned earlier, that's really sensitive data that you don't want to collect in a very granular way anyway. So it's better to do that kind of adaptation on the client's device, if possible. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I keep giving Apple as an example, but yesterday they announced that the micro adaptations that they do to Siri are also all client side. So I think something similar would also be good for uh, TLA. So this is how I would propose to change the TLA architecture based on, on these recommendations. So I do not want the TLA data core to collect context data, or at the very least, I only want to collect that data at an aggregate level. I want to use the context data more at the client side, if possible, right? And get rid of it in the data core. And then finally, another change that I want to propose is the introduction of some kind of formal access control mechanism uh, for user-facing applications to actually access the learner facts and the learner profile. This prevents apps from unfettered access to the user data. And I think that's important because, again, an application can be, at some point, can become nefarious. So we want to make sure that 
we allow um, uh, some access control there. So we're currently working on usable interaction mechanisms to, uh, for users to manage uh, access control. So our proposal here is, um, so, so the idea is to um, ask users uh, uh, for permission every time an application accesses data in the data core. But as I mentioned earlier, that's really complex and, and people are not very good at these decisions. So I'm working on a way to manage this, um, uh, to make this more manageable for people. So the idea is, first of all, to really request minimal amounts of data and really avoid duplicate storage. That really reduces liability. Um, and to de-identify uh, wherever, uh, um, wherever feasible. Um, and so currently I'm working on, on a, a kind of usable interaction mechanism to, to manage access control. And this idea is user-tailored privacy, where machine learning algorithms would help the users decide what to share um, with which apps. So beyond all this, when we ask users for these uh, uh, permissions, we can, we can use user-tailored user privacy as a way to uh, offload some of their behaviors. Now, this will be the topic of the second part of our project, of our uh, ADL-sponsored uh, project. So there will be another document and hopefully another set of webinars uh, once we get to that point. All right, so TLA's user data is can be formally owned by multiple uh, entities at once, right? So um, when a user does a training for their job, the training provider, the employer, and the user themselves kind of become stakeholders in this collected data. So the TLA needs to somehow deal with this concept of shared ownership. That's important. Um, moreover, if we say that users are the final responsible party when it comes to managing this data, they may not be always have the time to be actively involved in the management of their personal data and in the management of the settings of each separate application. Now, user tailor privacy is one way to alleviate this problem. Another way is data stewardship. So here, in this idea, another entity, for instance, a training department manager, could be the uh, responsible for managing the user's uh, data on their behalf. And then finally, when users move between different instantiations of the TLA, uh, the system should provide some support for data mobility as well. So that, that's another important aspect here. So how do we do that? How do we, how do we provide um, this idea of stewardship? Well, one good way to think about ownership um, and stewardship is to compare user's profile, user's data, kind of with a 401k. So the user is the formal owner of this data. The employer or the training department manager can actually manage the data and contribute to it. But the data can also move with the user in case they change employer or division. Now, this means that user models will have to be portable. Um, and when the user moves from one, from one uh, employer to the next, some data may remain hidden because it might be confidential. So that's important. And users may also want to redact some of the data from their previous employer uh, before transferring it, transferring it to their new employer if there was anything that they, they don't want the next employer to know. So this first employer will still have access to the user's data as well, but no data that is newly generated will be transferred to the first employer. That will actually stay uh, with the new employer only. So, I think um, the best way to do this is to uh, de-identify the data um, that is still available to the former employer. Um, the reason why you want to keep this is for um, uh, analytics purposes, right? Because th that data might still be used to optimize learning algorithms, et cetera. Um, 
or for instance to write uh, digital recommendation letters uh, um, um, that the ex for the ex-employees um, and maybe provide a way to, to make post hoc corrections to the data if there was anything wrong, like regrading re a test or something like that. Um, and as I mentioned, not all the data should be transferred to the new employer because some of it is confidential and it should, um, if users don't want to share it, then um, they, they, they shouldn't share it. And, but if the employer thinks that it's confidential and that it shouldn't go out, for instance, in the civilian wor world, they should also be allowed to uh, keep it, keep it uh, confidential. So there needs to be some kind of um, two-party management system where only if both parties agree with disclosing the information will it be disclosed. And there are some ways to, be, uh, to do this algorithmically using private equity testing. So that's a way to, uh, uh, to actually um, provide this kind of uh, technology. So users may not have time to be actively involved in the management of their personal data. And so I introduced this idea of data stewardship, where another entity, such as a training department manager, can manage the data on the user's behalf. Uh, the data steward would, be, uh, would set up the TLA system, and they would share data with the TLA-based application as they deem appropriate. Uh, although users may, of course, tweak these settings as well. And for sensitive data uh, or classified data, the TLA can enforce some kind of mechanism where both of the two parties uh, have to agree. And for some things, uh, like social networking preferences, the steward might give full control, actually, to the user themselves, if it's something that the user really, really cares about. So we're about uh, at time, but I have one more uh, section to go through. So please bear with me as I, as I move through this. But I do want to encourage questions as well, if there are any. Um, so I'm just going to go through, and I'll move questions to the end. But if you have questions right now, uh, please let me know. So for the final part of the webinar, I want to discuss how uh, data can be used and shared within an organization outside of the TLA-based system itself. So we consider the value of expecting, inspecting your own data the dynamics of social sharing, so sharing with other, with peers, basically, the ethics of user research, and the validity of making employment decision based on training data collected by TLA-based applications. So this uh, details on this aspect can be found in section five of the specification document. So when it comes to data sharing, the user themselves should first and foremost have access to their own data. And I've mentioned this earlier, and I mentioned this term scrutability. Um, it's very important, um, first of all, to increase trust and understanding of what is going on. But also, um, usable, uh, uh, if, if we create usable data displays, then it can provide a powerful quantified self-experience. So users can explore can explore patterns in the data by, uh, by themselves. And this allows them to discover what makes their own learning effective and where they require improvement. So really, when it comes to this idea of self-actualization, of putting people in control over their own learning, showing them their own data is really important. So that's one way of sharing data outside of the uh, TLA system is with the users themselves. So what about social learning? So Another sharing opportunity is through social learning, and research has shown that learning together improves learning performance. However, it can also lead to privacy problems. And since learning is a relatively private experience, social learning apps should not just simply share learning outcomes with all of the user's contacts or social network. Instead, they should allow users to selectively decide whom to share with. So the app can even help with this um, and suggest sharing uh, the learning experience with friends who have similar performance. So uh, this, uh, this is also a way to uh, best pair users with uh, people who have similar communication styles. So for instance, either FYI users or non-FYI users. <coughs> so 
Performance data collected within the TLA can also be used to improve learning um, uh, through research and to decide on promotions and to uh, plan uh, missions. So this secondary use of information, it may not always be expected by the users. And so you should be very clearly communicating to the users when data is being used for, for instance, to do research or for promotion purposes or to plan a mission. So users may insist that their data does not completely represent them. And so if you make promotion and mission planning decisions just on the data within TLA, they may not feel comfortable with that. They may feel like you want to do that more holistically. So there needs to be a dialogue with the user when the data is used for that kind of purpose to explain how the data is being used exactly and how other aspects are taken into account as well. And for certain type of practices, it's better to require the users to opt in rather than to allow them to opt out. So, um, and another thing we can do is, is uh, add a layer of review by an institutional review board uh, whenever um, um, data is being used outside of the normal purposes. And finally, administrators could give users uh, a say in the development of procedures surrounding uh, secondary uses of information. For instance, uh, peer assessment could be uh, done in a more um, user-centric way. So, that concludes the last section of our webinar. So let's review what we have learned. In this webinar, I've provided some recommendations that will allow ADL and other TLA performers to select the operational characteristics that best alleviate users' privacy concerns. Unfortunately, I've only been able to give you a brief overview. Our first specification document, which you can find online, has much more de details uh, regarding each of these recommendations and all the things I've talked about today. Um, the recommendations in there, as well as the ones that I presented today, are still tentative. So please read the specification document or parts of it, uh, parts of it and really let me know what you think. Uh, my email address is available, I think, so please contact me if you, if you want to uh, learn more. Um, I really want to foster kind of a continued discussion about each of these issues as we move forward. And eventually, I'll actually come looking and knocking on your door to ask you for your opinion. So it's better to uh, get it out of the way already. So in general, our recommendations convey the following topics. How to best support users' decision-making practices. What considerations need to be uh, made regarding uh, the collection of various types of data. How to effectively present recommendations and, and uh, adaptations while avoiding privacy uh, problems. How personal data should be uh, managed within the TLA system architecture, so the storage, etc how data should be shared between people involved in the TLA in a responsible manner. So, that's all. As I mentioned in the beginning, there will be separate webinars still for uh, activity providers and training department managers. And the webinar materials uh, and the full specification documents uh, will be available uh, at this web address. So, um, Thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, I will now open the floor for questions, if there are any questions left. Any questions, feel free to ask. Anyone? Well, feel free to uh, send me an email as well. If you, oh, I think there's one raised hand. Yep, you can unmute, yeah. Hello, yeah, go ahead. Hi. Hi. Yeah, this is, this is Fritz over at EdgeWorks. Um, one of the concerns that's been increasing in, in recent years is what uh, what roles and privileges do you think that systems themselves should have to data. So for instance, should systems that operate on data know uh, whose data they're operating on? 
So should systems know whose data they're operating on? Um, right. And, and how, what do you think about basically um, sort of role-based access control mm -hmm. built into the data itself so that systems can't actually go and, yeah. and sort of hoover all of the, the data? Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's, there's two different things there, right? Um, one is, so, so it depends on what you mean by system. Uh, if you if you talk about the system itself, should the system itself have that information built in? Um, it's hard not to, right? It's hard to like there are advances in in uh, data obfuscation, anonymity, and holomorphic encryption that could allow the system to provably not have any idea of whose data is in the system. But then those kinds of applications are still very limited. And like I think that's unrealistic. So having no data whatsoever about who is in the system in the system is impossible. Now, um, who can access that data is then the next question, right? So can we make it so that the people who manage the system, for instance, can't access the data? That only certain people can access that data. I think there you can. I can say yes. Um, the access control is important. There are mechanisms to build access control in a kind of infallible way so that there's no, no back door. Um, those mechanisms are also not without any, any problems, obviously, but that is possible. Now, that still means that people need to make those access control decisions. Because if I, as a user, um, allow my supervisor to know some information about me, I may not want to give them all my information. So there's still that human decision on top of that. But yes, once you have that human decision in place and once you're able to manage that, which is a difficult thing in itself, but once you have that in place, you could enforce that uh, through technical means if you, if you want. Does that answer your question? Uh, it answers the second part for sure. Okay. Um, the, the first part, um, certainly the, the systems have the data on them, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm thinking about you know, should system administrators be allowed to sort of willy-nilly browse browse data? And is that yeah. a policy that's realistic or enforceable? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's it is like technically, I think it is enforceable to to not allow the system administrators to to see that data. But I think in most practical applications it's somewhat unrealistic in, in the sense that if there is nobody other than the user who can access the data, then all the burden of deciding who gets to see which information ends up falling on the user. And if you're using a training application that interfaces with many other training applications and with other users, et cetera, Making those decisions can be really overwhelming. So that's why I had this idea of, of uh, data stewardship, where you can say, well, these administrators, they might be able to see this data. I am still the owner of the data. They don't own it. But they are allowed to manage the data for me, to see the data, to manage the data for me. And they can be bound by some kind of fiduciary responsibility, where you say, OK, I have this contract with the data steward who makes decisions on my behalf and who can see my data. But we have a very clear contract of what they can do with this data and what they can't. That, that's kind of my idea, because I think it's, it's very difficult to really not allow anyone except for the end user to um, be in control of their data and at the same time help them um, uh, with their data decisions. So I think, I think there needs to be a middle ground there. And then do you have any thoughts about um, sort of worst case scenarios, namely things like you know, databases get, get leaked and all the records get exposed on the web, um, about sort of revocation and how to pull back from, from privacy violating events? Yeah. I mean, it's a genie out of the bottle, right? It's, it's really hard to 
once data is out there, it's really hard to get it back. It's impossible to get it back, basically. Um, I, I think, again, I'm going to give you a nuanced answer in the sense that um, you're the ones, data that, if there's data where you say, okay, this would be a literal disaster if it gets out there, you really want to encrypt that data. Uh, you do not want to trust uh, the security of, 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 of access control mechanisms like passwords or, or even two-factor authentication or anything like that um, to, to prevent access. I think you simply do not want to store that data in a way that, that is accessible. And we already do this with passwords, right? If you hash passwords nicely, then you know if password hashes get out there, you know like especially if it's if it's done with a with a good hashing algorithm and if it's salted and everything, then it's really difficult. Like it would take hundreds of years for people to to uh, um, to uncover the password that is connected to it. And I think that's that's the kind of situation you want to go to. You want to have access control, and you know my birthday, you know. It, it's probably publicly available anyway, so it doesn't matter too much. My social security number and my bank information, you do want to hash that. So I think that is true for a lot of this kind of information. And again, certain information, if you can avoid collecting it, and if you can use it on the client side, then you don't have this problem at all. So I would be very, I don't think revocation is very easy unless you, like the only surefire way it, can't be harmful is if it's very carefully encrypted. Right, right. So in terms of revocation and damage control, um, is it, I mean, I'm trying to put this in a way that doesn't sound inflammatory, is it? Is it your opinion that it's something that you should just never have the opportunity to, to ask a question about? Or is it something where, you know, Basically, it's a it's a it's a losing game. Once the data's out, it's out, and revocation and damage control, yeah, aren't really effective at that point. Um, I, I would for ninety percent go for that latter answer. I do, I do know that there are um, there are um, how do I say this? There there are challenges out there. There are people out there who are starting to think about the challenge of what if we go from prevention to mitigation, right? What if we go from data, uh, from, from the prevention of breaches to the mitigation of breaches? Because if you think about it in corporate settings, that's typically what is being done, is, is mitigation after the fact. Um, when I was in a room with several people, both government and business that talked about this, the government people said, no, <laughs> we do not do uh, mitigation. We do only prevention. That was an NSA person who said that. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> uh, I think building systems for the military, they may very well have that mindset of we do not want to do mitigation. We only want to do prevention. And so in, in most cases, we'll, we'll have to deal with that. <laughs> um, and, and then, on, so, so that's on the kind of ideological side. And then on the practical side, I would say there aren't too many me mechanisms out there right now for mitigation uh, other than PR, <laughs> uh, practically. So, uh, um, yeah, I, I would say right now, 90% prevention, maybe 10% mitigation. And that might change over time, but it's a very slow process. Okay, thanks. Yo. Very welcome. Thanks for the questions. Uh, anyone else who uh, who has a question? Well, I, I really want to thank everyone for for listening. And sorry for um, going uh, quite generously over time. Um, if you uh, want to join the other webinars, they they um, will be available. They will be similar, but uh, have some additional information in there. Um, and I will post the slides, and um, if the recording worked, this was the first time trying this, if the recording works, I will also post that online, so you can send this around to your colleagues, etc., uh, if you want.
and thanks everyone for listening.